Welcome, folks. So glad to have you here, and I'm glad you got to enjoy our music. We always ask our speakers to choose a song uh, that they love or inspired by, get pumped up by, and so thank you to Oveta for that, and I'm glad y'all were enjoying it. Uh, my name is Danielle. I'm the CEO of Women Talk Design, and I'm really thrilled to have y'all here this evening or afternoon, wherever you are, uh, for our Speaker Stories event. Uh, quick note that I want to make is that we do have live captioning for this event. So I'm going to drop that link in the chat. You can also find it at the top of your Zoom. It should say it's live streaming with Otter. Uh, it's imperfect, it's automated, but feel free to use that to follow along as well. We're also recording this event and we'll have a blog post as a follow-up. So just a couple of quick notes. Um, I want to share a bit about this series. This is the third month we're heading into where we're doing the speaker stories. And the, we had a couple different goals when setting this up. At Women Talk Design, our mission is to help get a more diverse group of speakers on stage. And so we really want to make sure that folks are inspired to start speaking and have the tools that they need uh, to feel confident starting to speak up. And with this series, we've been featuring different speakers in our community from all over the world with different backgrounds and, and work that they do, who've had different journeys getting into speaking. And so it's been really awesome to hear everyone's story and also the advice that they've learned along the way. And so the format of um, today's event, how it's going to go is that I will introduce our speaker. I have some pre-prepared questions that we're going to start with, and then we'll leave the second half for Q&A. We really want to hear from you, why you joined, what questions you have for Oveta. So please keep those in mind. I'll remind you all of this when we start our Q&A, but what I'll have you do is share your question in the chat. And then you can also share if you want to speak up or if you want me to read it for you. Um, we're gonna ask people to put it there to just avoid folks speaking over one another and to give everyone a chance to share. Um, but then, like I said, you can unmute and talk to Oveta yourself or I can read it for you depending on if you're in a place that you can't unmute right now. I also welcome you to stick around for the last 15 minutes. That's when um, we will encourage you to join a breakout room. We'll put groups people in small groups so that they can meet one another. We have some questions about where you are in your speaker journey, what you learned from this evening, and it's a really great way to connect with other folks in the community. Um, and so I invite you to stick around for that. But without further ado, I am so thrilled to introduce you to our speaker today. We had a really great conversation just uh, even in the couple of minutes before y'all joined, and I know that you are going to learn so much from her. Uh, Oveta Sampson is here with us today, and she is the Principal Creative Director at Microsoft, where she works with a team of talented researchers, designers, and engineers, which then works with large-scale customers to visualize a clear path to digital transformation that starts in the now and builds towards the future. Oveta is an IDEO alum, and her sweet spot is really the intersection of humanity, business, and technology. She uses a variety of research and design and engineering methods to inspire innovation in various industries, including mobility, retail, service, insurance, and healthcare. She also specializes in envisioning human-centered experiences for future technologies. Combining her MS in computer science and her BA in communications, Oveta spends most of her time helping people visualize humanity's future and how to ethically and with compassion serve people through digital and intellectual products. When she's not working or teaching, Oveta is swimming, biking, and running in exotic locales, doing these races called Ironmans. I don't know if y'all have heard of them. They are real hard. Uh, and Oveta has spoken at all different types of events, including the UX Research Collectives Conference, Epic, Afrotech, TEDx Chicago, and 99U. We are so thrilled to have her here. So please help me welcome Oveta. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I love the waved hands. <laughs> Veto, we are so glad to have you here. And to start off the conversation, it would be great to just hear a little bit about what, what are some of the topics that you, you really care about right now? What are some of the things that you're currently speaking about and, and why are they important to you? Yeah. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to explain my decor. I'm here in Chicago with my mom. Uh, my mom's 81 years old. And so she recently had a fall. She's fine. But I flew back from Seattle to hang out with her. So behind me is my um, third grade 
family pictures that we took that are still up there. I think I was eight years old. So this is about 40 years ago. So uh, I didn't have time to like redo the decor and my mom won't let me either. So it's the 1970s panel and the den and my photos of my mom, me and all the stuff of me growing up. So that's what you see behind me. I was gonna try to take it down, but uh, Danielle said she liked it. So I was gonna leave it there. So, um, so the topics that I am really, it's so funny because what I'm obsessed about right now is a new era of product making that we are going to enter. So I spent a lot of my time talking about mindfulness and AI. Um, and I used to spend a lot of my time talking about ethics and bias in AI, but I've moved on from that. And I'm talking about mindful creation now and trying to redesign how we design products um, and really doing this at Microsoft at uh, a tiny little scale and trying to grow it um, where we're breaking down silos between engineering and research and design and even sales and marketing, right? Like I'm trying to conquer all of that and break that all down because the way that we need to make uh, AI products in the future we have to get beyond kind of like the task oriented AI that we are now, kind of like the slave master um, kind of setup we have now and more into ecosystems and designing whole environmental systems that have to do with a lot of human and machine relationships rather than humans kind of like um, kind of directing machines. Um, it's gonna be machines and machines talking to each other and humans and machines talking to each other and then a whole ecosystem going on. And so we have to kind of like re redesign the way that we design these kinds of new, uh, almost communities, right? That we're gonna be designing rather than just like a device and a user. And so that's kind of like what my brain is um, putting to the forefront for me. Um, even though I think I'm, I'm, I'm like five or 10 years ahead of it, but I'm still trying to think about that. And so whenever I speak about AI, I always talk about this machine and human relationship rather than um, um, human centered design or something like that. So that's kind of where my, my, my brain is going. And I'm writing a lot about it and speaking a lot about it and being interviewed on podcasts a lot. And so I'm trying to kind of like codify that into a tactical strategy. So that's what I'm doing. And that's what I'm talking about most. Yeah, I love that. It was so great to hear, even in your response, hearing a bit about the evolution, about what you've been speaking about and how you're coming to the, this new theme that you're going to speak more on. Yeah, my, my poor team, I'm just trying out all kinds of new things. They're my guinea pigs. I make them do all kinds of crazy things. And they don't understand why I asked them to do it. But uh, it's, it's, I'm trying to get from the abstract to the concrete really fast um, because I'm really into tactical kind of like codifying tactics on how to take really great ideas and, and, and bring them to fruition. And I, and I'm, if you read, if you go to any of my speeches or you listen to them, they're all very tactical. They started in the abstract, but, and, and they're all about storytelling, but at the end, I'm trying to codify something so that you can take it away and experiment. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I want to hear more about that uh, process of like coming up with these new ideas and, and really thinking them through. Um, but first, I want to take a step back and hear how you even got started in public speaking. So if you can remember like what that first experience was like, how you got that engagement uh, and anything you can remember from that. Yeah. So this is funny, Danielle. When I went over the questions, I told you, I said, I'm so used to speaking about technology and design and myself but I'm never used to speaking about how I got into speaking. And so I had to really think about this. And I cannot remember a time, a year in my life where I wasn't on stage and there was an audience in front of me. So to be quite honest, my first gig, I was three years old and I only had, I had two lines to say. And it was like, it, they were, we are little mice, if you please. We are here to eat your cheese. And it was doing our school play uh, Pied Piper, but 
I went to Holy Angels, which was the largest Black Catholic school in the nation. And so our school plays were at the Blackstone Theater, and they were full-fledged uh, theater productions with uh, musical numbers and set changes and production crews, as well as celebrities like Jerry Butler and Janet Jackson and Diana Ross. So my first like images of me on stage with an audience what started when I was like in kindergarten and went all the way every year till I was in eighth grade. And it didn't occur to me that other people didn't have their school plays at a huge theater at, in downtown Chicago until I went to college and people were like, no, my school play was in a gym. I don't understand what you're talking about. So I feel like I've been on stage for all of my life, but um, my first actual speaking gig so I started in theater and did theater in college. And so theater really is theater. You do two things. You're in front of an audience and you're memorizing everything. Right. And so that really helps with speaking. But then I was a reporter, too. And so that that is like that's you're speaking. You're asking questions. You're you're in, engaging with people. And so I quite frankly, Danielle, I'm a ringer. I, I don't really remember the first time I ever like. I never had to, yeah, I've yeah. never had to seek out a speaking gig. People have always asked me to speak, but it wasn't until like four or five years ago that I got really serious about making money as a speaker and doing it professionally. And so we can talk about that. But, but yeah, I've always been speaking because I like to talk, but I think there was an arc from me standing on stage and just taking up 10 minutes to me crafting a speech that people want to pay to listen to. And that that is that is a, a nice arc that I, I'd love to talk about because it's really important that if you want to be a speaker, you have to remember your audience. Like that's the first thing. And they're coming to listen to you. And you should you should really be professional about that time. Yeah. So tell us more about that. I want to, I want to dive into that. Uh, if we can hear more about how, you know, you, like you said, you're performing all your life. Um, maybe even when you started speaking professionally um, for work, like, do you have a couple of uh, key experiences yeah. that you remember even, you know, before you're at kind of the stage that you are now? Yeah. I think I started speaking when I was a journalist and I was doing, I had a couple fellowships. And so I had to speak about the work that I was doing in juvenile justice and social justice. And so uh, I was in Colorado Springs. I was about, I was about in my early twenties and I was, a, I, I have a natural talent for speaking and writing. So, so that's good. But I had a friend, a mentor, he, his, he was an older black gentleman named Willie Bazell. He was also a Republican. He was like the first black Republican I ever met. And he said, you know, you should go to Toastmasters. And I was like, what's that? Like I hadn't even, I didn't know that that was a whole international organization that was focused on, on speaking. And he was also in the Rhodes Scholar group. Like he was, like he introduced me to all these very professional networks. And so I, it was my first job or my second job out of college. And he suggested I go to Toastmasters. And that really helped because one of the things that Toastmasters does is it prepares you to do very short speeches to long speeches, but really it prepares you to put together a story um, from beginning to end. And so that was like my first exposure to this, to the tactical part of speaking. That, that, they, that you had to have an introduction and you had to have a middle and you had to have an end and you had to have something that connect like a through line that connected them through that. And I had already done that at storytelling, but, it, but when you're speaking, you, ha you don't have as much time as you do with a story and you have to do it in a, in a kind of truncated way and in a very deliberate way. Um, and so Toastmasters were the first time when I went, I must've been in my twenties, like 20 years ago, where I actually had notes on a note card for speaking. Uh, before that, I just kind of stood up and talked. Um, and I feel really bad for those audiences. And I, I, I really apologize for that. And then professionally about, so, so after Toastmasters, I was a pretty okay speaker, but it, it wasn't until I started working at IDEO about four years ago uh, in 2016 that 
um, people wanted to pay for me to, to people offered to pay for me to speak um, because of the work that I was doing. And so at that point, the two things that help elevate my speaking game, like the UX research speech that you saw was like one of my first speeches where I actually had a speech mentor. It was somebody who I worked with on that speech. I'm a pretty good speech writer. I've written speeches for other people, but it's really great to have someone to work through the speech with you before you give it. That was the first time I had ever done that. And I, you know, I'm not bragging, but that UX research speech was pretty good. Um, and I think the reason why it was pretty good is because I had a special combination of, of my style of speaking. I like to be very authentic. And I like, I started off with showing you my pictures. I like to just, I like to, cause I'm, you, one of the things that I love that I think if you want to be a speaker that you have to bring to the table is authenticity because people, there are tons of speakers speaking about all kinds of things that you probably want to speak about, but none of them are you. Right. And so I love speakers who bring themselves into the, the professional topic, uh, who speak about especially their their highs and their lows and how they got out of them. So I'm a real tactical speaker, like I, I talked about before. And so having a speech mentor was really great. That really kind of elevated elevated that that my elevated me from being a good speaker to being a speaker that people would actually pay for. Um, and then once you get that one amazing professional speech on video somewhere, um, you won't have a problem with people calling you because it will go quote unquote speech viral, which means it'll go through the speaking circuit, right? Of your industry. So if you're in design or if you're in tech, um, people share it, people talk about it. Um, and then people tell other conferences about you and say, hey, is she gonna be speaking at this conference or whatever? And then all of a sudden people start ringing the phone off the hook. So when I, after I started working at IDEO, probably in 2017, I spoke at Afrotech. And then for the next 18 months, I spoke in London, Glasgow, Singapore. I was invited to speak in Pakistan and India. Um, I spoke um, in Toronto. I spoke in New York and 99U. And I, and I just kind of like, I was due to speak in Melbourne, Australia this year. Oh my God. And so many great places this year that I can't Tokyo and all that kind of stuff. And so it just kind of like spiraled from there. So I spent like 18 months pretty much traveling speaking, but I, I also was also doing some really amazing stuff. Some at IDEO in, in AI and in the ethics realm. And so I was speaking about stuff that was really topical um, and and so that's kind of how now I don't do pro bono speaking anymore. Um, and, and I'm transitioning to being a professional paid speaker. Yeah, that's awesome. Thanks for walking us through that journey. And I'm sure folks are gonna have more questions about that. Uh, a question that I have about kind of this, this part, this journey and where it fits in in the process. I know that you gave a TEDx uh, several yeah. years ago. And I'm curious how that fits in, you know, it's also, a different topic than you you speak about for work. You talked about uh, your experience in, in your Ironman and training for that. And so um, I'd love if you can share a little bit about how you got connected with that opportunity and how you think about that in the terms of your speak, speaking arc. Yeah, that's kind of funny because um, I was uh, approached by, so um, TEDx is done at college level. So it's done in college towns. Uh, you usually at the university. And so I spoke at the TEDx at the University of Chicago. And so the, the group that was planning the TEDx panel, which was an amazing panel, by the way, um, uh, reached out to me because they usually have a theme. And so here, so media and, and speaking kind of like cross pollinate a lot. Um, if you're, so that previous year, I had, I, had, I had done my Ironman in 2013, uh, but then I started um, 
a couple of organizations to help African American women uh, who didn't know how to swim to learn how to swim so that they could do triathlons. And so I started like Ebony Mermaids and all of these group groups to help uh, Black women who notoriously weren't swimming to learn how to swim. And so that got covered in like the Chicago Reader and some other places. And so somebody read that and it was like, hey, uh, for TEDx Chicago, we would love for you to tell your experience on stage. And so I had written, so this is, this is a second rule of speaking. Um, it's kind of like the first rule of, so the first rule is, is to respect your audience, right? Like respect the time, be professional about it. The second one is, um, it's kind of like the rule of karaoke where you don't sing a karaoke song that you actually don't know the words to, like, don't do that. That's not good. With, with professional speaking, the second rule is know your subject matter really well. <laughs> Like you should really not speak about things that you don't know about, to be quite honest. And so this one was about me. It was about my journey. And I had already written that story before. And um, it was really, it, was, it wasn't easy, but it was different to transition that from the page to the stage. And so when you're transitioning things from the page to the stage, you have to remember it's kind of like a screenplay um, where you only, TEDx gives you 18 minutes and a mic. So you don't have it notes and you don't have your laptop and there's no PowerPoint. You can, you can have things behind you, but that's about it. Like a, like a PowerPoint that you don't control. So it just kind of like rotates on its own. And so you really have to have your uh, beginning, middle and end really kind of very tech, like packed tightly like a screenplay. You, you have to do the arc, right? So you, you should start, you know, with some tension <laughs> and some conflict. Um, and I do a three sentence outline for anything that I write, speak or whatever. It's only three sentences and it starts with conflict. It starts with, um, uh, um, and, and then in the middle, the first is a conflict and then in the middle is, is a bridge to how it was solved. And then the last is the resolution. So that's really simple, but um, you, I take whatever the thousand words were and I put it into that outline. And if I can't put it into the outline, then I know I'm not ready to speak. And so, so when you're doing a TEDx talk, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for that story arc. They're looking for the beginning where something happens and it's conflict. And then in the middle, you talk about how you uh, wrestled with the conflict. And at the end, the resolution and the outcome. And so um, when you're doing a TEDx talk, it's an inspirational talk too. So you want to make sure that people take away very kind of like hard line things that they can apply to their own life. Um, and so my TED talk pre preparation was, um, I, I kind of depended on my theater background because I had to memorize my speech, all 18 minutes of it. Um, but it was really easy because once I had my, my milestones, my beginning, middle and end, I just had to get there, right? I knew the, the thing, I knew the different transitions to get there. And so I write my speeches in transitions rather than in blocks. Um, I really kind of memorize the transition points and then just kind of like do notes or whatever on the middle. Um, and so that really helped to, to do that because it was about my journey, but I had to like make that journey inspirational for other people. And so my last chapter is always like summation of takeaways. Um, so I do the takeaways for the audience. I'm like, all right, so we went through this journey and here are your takeaways. I loved hearing that like really nitty gritty. This is, this is my process. This is how I do it. And you yeah. know, I think a lot of speakers have their own way of approaching it. And it's yeah. really helpful yeah. to hear. And you have to find one that's good this. for you. Yeah. yeah. And my, my process comes because I used to be a nonfiction feature writer when I was, um, when I was a reporter. And so if you think about Charles Dixon, Charles Dickens writing, but nonfiction, that's the kind of, I did what's called narrative journalism. And so in narrative journalism, it's really important that you have that kind of conflict resolution kind of thing, because it's a long story and you have to have people wanting to, to stick around. And so that's usually the basis of, of how I start my personal speeches. My professional speeches are kind of, kind of go along the same line where I, 
it's kind of like the design process where there's like, here's the problem statement and here are all the different ways that you can solve it. But more in my professional speeches, I tend to repeat my points along the way so that by the time you get to the last chapter, you've heard them all, but then I put them together like a little Lego puzzle. Love that. Yeah. So you're like, yeah. no excuses. You know what? I want you to get away from this. That's great. Um, yeah. And I see some folks starting to drop questions in the chat. I'm going to turn to those in just a second. So I encourage you to keep your questions coming and then we'll start to ask Oveta those. Uh, the, the last question I want to ask before that is if you could share a little bit more about where you are now in your journey. I know you referenced this a little bit to, you know, now being at the point that you're um, speaking when you're getting paid for your speaking engagements. And I'm curious if you can share a little bit about how you evaluate, you know, you, you, we men you mentioned before uh, we got on this call that you're getting reached out to every day to speak. So how do you make those yeah. decisions about what to say yes to and, and what to say no to? Yeah, I think my speaker's arc is a lot like other speaker's arcs where you speak at conferences who are just desperate to put people on the stage, right? They're just like, we need to put a lot of speakers up there. And, and so you're like, you're new and so it's like flattering, right? It's like super great that somebody wants to, to listen to you for 45 minutes. And I went through that for like maybe about two years. And it, it's just really hard because, because every speech I do is unique. It's, 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 just, it's like a design process. It's a product to me. And so I go through discovery and I go through, you know, synthesis and I go through, you know, uh, building the speech. It takes a lot of time. So I, I kind of like, um, what I figured it out, if I was gonna, if I was gonna charge, I had to figure out like, how much time do I put into, into speeches? And I figured out, I put about 10 hours um, in, into an hour long speech. Um, and, I, and I said, what is 10 hours of my time worth, right? Um, and so I'm like, $100 an hour, okay, a thousand bucks, right? Like that's what, what I started with. And I remember I posted this on LinkedIn and I said, I had, I had spoken at Design Up in Singapore. So this so the first one is like you speak anywhere because they ask you to. The second one is you like, um, I'm I don't really want to take off work to go speak because then I'd have to take off work. And and IDEO was one of these places like they love you speaking because it goes with their brand. And so it's kind of like, yes, please speak. It's part of your like your it's like you get evaluated on it as a leader there. Um, and so they don't mind you going to speak. And so, but I was a design researcher, so it was really hard for me to get off work. So I'm like, if I'm going to get off work and, and speak at your conference in London or whatever, then I'm going to need something for that. And so then the second part is like, they pay your accommodations and travel, right? So they don't give you a stipend, but they'll pay for you to travel there and stuff like that. And that's really cool. Like you could see like the whole world doing that. And I, and I, I would have been fine with just doing that too. But then the, the requests started kind of like getting up, upwards of, you know, it went from like one a month to like one every three weeks to like one a week. And now it's like literally one a day. And so I started thinking about the time that I was putting into speeches, the time that I had to work and how much that was costing me to be away from work and not actually doing the stuff that they wanted me to speak about, <laughs> to be quite honest. And, and then I started evaluating the conferences themselves. And so um, 99U was one that I decided to speak at because I felt that it was good professionally um, for IDEO, but also for myself. Um, and it was around AI and ethics. And so it was a topic I was passionate about, but that's the kind of caliber of, of conferences that I will speak at. I won't, I don't do regional conferences a lot. Um, I, because I've done them before. And so I'm always like, here's the archive or whatever. Um, but I do, so there's three things that I care a lot about and that's AI and, and uh, mindful AI and creating ethical AI products, being, an, being African-American and being a woman. So those three are like my top. So if somebody are from those three kind of groups, then then I definitely will say they go to the top of the list. It, it's not like I don't speak at other places, but those other places are like not even getting into the door unless they're paying me money. Um, the Those three 
I, I evaluate based upon the audience. So if it's new designers or people who are new to the group or whatever, I have one-on-ones with folks rather than speaking at a conference. I will, I have one-on-ones every Friday. Uh, you can sign up um, where I get that time face-to-face -face with people. Um, but like places like Afrotech, which where, where I know it's big and I know I'll be a VIP, all that kind of stuff. That's fun. And so I go. So that's like a personal and professional and self-care thing. And so I kind of vet based upon the topics and the organization and then the audience. Um, do I feel like what I'm saying is very important? So I speak to a lot of data science groups uh, who are not in design because I feel like they need to hear what I have to say, to be quite honest. Um, but now I am transitioning to being a paid speaker so that I can write my book. And so when I get those speaking uh, requests, I can just go here, buy this book and then. And so, so I'm at the point of my career where I am building Oveta's personal brand. And so building my personal brand is really important to me, not because I wanna be, you know, Brene Brown, but more because I, I want as many people to hear what I have to say. And if I, and writing a book helps that. Um, and so if I speak at this place for 45 minutes, then that means I'm not working on my book. And so I have to kind of like vet those. We can't wait to read your book. Uh, have, I know. Is, it, is it something you started already or just like it's in the, it's in the horizon? Yeah, well, I, it's, I know we're going to talk about it right after this. And then mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm looking for a publisher right now. I have an outline, um, but I, when I say I'm writing my book, it really is this, it's, I have this thing in my brain um, for me to do things like when I decided to do an Iron Man, I have to like say it as like, when I decided to I have to do an Iron Man, I was like 200, I was like 289 pounds. There was no way I was doing an Iron Man. But in my mind, I was telling myself, I'm doing an Iron Man. And it's the same thing with the book. I'm writing a book. I have no idea when this book is going to come out, how it's going to happen or whatever, but I'm writing a book. It's going to happen. So love it. I love yeah. that so much. That's great. That's awesome. We cannot wait for it. Um, <laughs> we're getting lots of questions in the chat. I'm going to prioritize some of the ones that are around speaking first. I know there's a couple of career related ones, but since it's the theme yeah. of today, um, but I am going to actually kind of merge those two things. I'm curious as people have asked about like transitioning in your career or any advice for designers. And I'm curious if you've seen benefits from speaking to help you in some of the transitions in your career, or if there's, you know, if speaking has helped you in your career. Yeah, I wouldn't be working at Microsoft if I didn't speak at my Afrotech. Like the person who recruited me at Microsoft was in the audience when I was speaking. Um, so, so, so one of the things about speaking is it's, <laughs> if you're doing it right, it's not about you, right? So you go on stage and you do your 45 minutes, but then you have the rest of the week to meet. Like 99U, come on. Like if you are speaking at 99U, even if you're just speaking in one of the workshops things, if you don't take advantage of the, the, the speaker's green room, the VIP room, the speaker's dinner, the speaker's, uh, like they have all of these things for the speakers, right? And that's when you're in the same room with like Tim Brown and all of these amazing people in design and tech, like I'm in the same room with Tim Brown anyway, but if you're, you know, whatever. And then you get to meet these people that you only see from afar on LinkedIn or whatever. If you're not taking advantage of that, then why are you speaking? I don't know. Like, it's okay. It's not, to me, it, it was never about my ego. It was more about like, people wanted to hear the things that I had to say. And that was awesome. And it was, they were actually applying it to their life, which was great. Um, and to their professional career. But for me, cause I, I remember my business manager saying, what do you get out of this? For me, it's all the people I get to meet. And I was speaking at Afrotech in 2017 and this woman named Lorraine, I met her at one at a networking party. And she said, have you ever thought about working at Microsoft? And I was like, no. And then we started talking. And so I feel like um, speaking, speaking also makes me more professional because what it does is it codifies, it helps me to, speaking is the one outlet that helps me to take all of these wild ideas I have about design and technology and, and AI and, and tactically 
communicate them. Um, it It's hard to talk to people about things that don't exist, right? We're designers. Design is a future oriented practice. And the number one skill set in design is storytelling. Why? Because you have to convince people of things that don't exist, that it will exist if you go through this process. And speaking helps me to do that because I'm speaking about my profession and what I do. And I'm trying to share that so that other people can take advantage of the things that I've learned. And I can't do that if I don't codify it and make it tactical. And that's what speaking does for me. That's why I do it because it force is a force function. It's a force function for me to get it out of here and get it into the world. Great, that's awesome. Uh, someone asked about uh, in, in your speaking practice and preparation if you've ever done improv. So I know that you uh, went to Toastmasters, and you know um, this person who asked shared that they have been told a lot that a lot of speakers, you know, first try improv. Do you have any experience of that or any recommendations for this person? So I did improv because I did theater, um, and so when you do theater, you do improv all the time. Um, I th then there when i was at microsoft we had a whole improv day we we brought in folks and did improv and when i was in ideo this is so funny when i was in ideo we had people from second city work with us on a project um to i spoke about this at the ux research but it or at uh epic um in hawaii yeah i went to hawaii to speak at epic that was awesome um um, and so we were, we, we couldn't use like real data P like we couldn't use real customers. And so we use second city players to be customers to these call center folks for this new system that we built so that we can do a usability test on it. And it was awesome. It was so great. Cause they were so amazing. And so that was like a time where I thought, man, you know, having something like Second City in Chicago or um, players in, in New York or, or LA or whatever, it's, it's, you should just run, not walk to some of their courses to just help you feel comfortable with making mistakes in front of audiences. And, and that's what improv does for me. It just makes me feel really comfortable that I'm not gonna die. Um, and so, I think it's, I think improv is, is great. Toastmasters improv, anytime that theater, anytime that you can get in front of an audience and know that you're going to make a mistake. Why? Because speaking is, it's hot coals, man. You're just out there. It's just you and the audience and you can prepare as much as you want, but you're probably going to make a mistake and learning how to deal with that is it separates, you know, good speaking from bad speaking. Yeah. Great advice. Awesome. We have a question from Mitra. Do you want to unmute and ask about the professional and personal side of speaking? Sure. Um, so, Oveta, you said to be both professional and personal. Is there a fine line with like being too personal to where you're not being professional? Yeah, I think, well, first of all, I think the first rule is know your audience, right? So, um, I don't, you know, I have I have spoken in front of you know four five star generals as well as um, kindergartners. I don't I don't talk about like my you know there are some certain things I just don't say to kindergartners right <laughs> like you just you just don't say that. So um, I think there there I think you can be personal with all of your audiences. This is why you need to practice. Right, and this is why you need a speech mentor because it's nice to have somebody go, "Whoa, are you sure you want to share that?" Um, it's nice to just bounce that off before you get up in front of the audience and hear. Because I've done that where I've said stuff and it's just like, "Woo, crickets," you know, didn't go over well. Um, so you want to kind of practice that in front of somebody who can give you a really good uh, litmus test about whether that's too personal or not. And when I say personal, I'm really, I really mean, so one of the things I learned when I was a journalist is for, I, and, I, and I did the type of stories that people really had to open up. Like I, I did a lot of features on people, people who were like, you know, terrorists who went to jail, who were murderers, who, 
were um, cheating on their wives, like that, all kinds of stuff. Cause you know, conflict, whatever. But to, to get people to trust me, one of the things that I would do is I would talk about something personal um, because it, it made them see me in a different light. And so I use that in, in speech telling because that's just me. And because I, I'm, I'm literally incapable of, of not blabbing stuff about myself <laughs> because I'm, I, I don't have a problem with being vulnerable, I, I guess. And so I feel like that's a really good speech tactic for me because I'm trying to tell them about how I got to decide that this was a good way to do something. And it's usually because I did it some other way and I failed. <laughs> um, and so that's what I do when I talk about, I talk about failure a lot um, because people only see my successes. And so I talk about failure a lot. And so that's what I mean about being impersonal. Um, I don't necessarily think that your speech should be a therapy session. Like I don't necessarily think that you should go seeking, um, you know, the type of things that you get from sharing because you want um, something beyond kind of connection. Um, so I think connection is, is what you're going after. Um, not, um, you know, a, a absolution, right? So the line between connection and absolution, I think is, is where you want to keep it. Great. Um, and we are running low on time, but we do have one last question that I think, um, sums things up well as a good, a good note to end on. Um, sorry, we didn't get to everyone's, but Kelly, do you want to ask your question about advice? Sure. Um, I wanted to know what's the most impactful piece of speaking advice you've uh, received? So, man, oh, God. I remember, yeah, I don't know if, if it's the most impactful, but it's the one I remember the most. I, I tend to have a very complex brain. Um, and it's not because I'm like super smart. It's more because I, I'm just a systems thinker and I, and I just kind of like, Nick knows this. I think in very, very complex kind of like circles. And I got it, an advice and it, and it seems really trite, but simplicity is the author of, 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 of a beautiful speech. Um, so a lot of the advice that I, I get about my speeches is, is to strip it down and, and get to the essence, uh, what's called the plank value of what you're trying to say. Um, and for those who know what plank value is, it's like the essence of something that's physics, whatever. See, see, complex mind. And so I recently gave a, a speech uh, to the design leader community at, at Microsoft and it was, it, was, it was about the plank value of design. And, and so physics is a very complex, um, uh, subject, but everybody understands the essence of something, right? And so that's what that speech was about. It was like, what is the essence of design? What do we mean when we say design? And and that that advice about getting to the eth the essence of what you're trying to communicate as fast as possible is the best. And I and I remember, and this is a writing reference, but I remember an editor would say to me when I would turn in my stories, he would say, "Clear your throat on your own time," right? And that meant cut out the first three paragraphs and get to the one paragraph that you really want people to know. I cried the first time I heard that. But then afterwards, I heard it and I'm like, yeah, I don't want to waste people's time. You don't want to waste someone's time. So don't, it's not, it's not a mystery, right? Like, don't try to wait to the end to get to the point, right? So, so stripping it down to the essence of what you're trying to communicate will make your speeches resonate so much better. That's fantastic advice. And you've shared so much great advice throughout this, really thinking about your audience and, um, you know, thinking about your process too. So very grateful, Oveta, for you sharing both your yeah. story and your um, advice with everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. The reason we're, we're cutting, the, cutting the conversation short now is, as I mentioned at the beginning, we find it's really important in these events to give you all an opportunity to connect with one another. Um, so hopefully you can stick around for these last 10 minutes. I'm going to explain what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to invite you to a breakout room. This is to give you a chance to chat with someone else who's here in attendance. Um, I'm going to drop some questions in the chat that you can use as jumping off points to meet one another. And then we'll bring it all back 
together um, just when there's about a minute left to send things off. But in the meantime, I want to give a big round of applause to Aveta. Thank you Thank so you. much again oh for being God, here. Oh my God, that was so fast. I know, it went really fast. I was like, I have a million other things I can ask you. And I know that the people in the chat wanted to as well. Um, I will send a follow-up to everyone who is here and share some links to um, some of the things that Oveta had mentioned. Um, and like I said, I hope that you can stick around and, and meet someone else. And a big thank you both to Oveta and all of you. Uh, so what I'm gonna do Thanks, right guys. now is, um, I'm gonna stop the recording.